Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me are Joe and Harris. Welcome, uh, Harris. Uh, Chris is uh, moving houses, so he was out, but luckily we had Harris lined up for tonight. What are you guys drinking tonight? I am drinking the good old zombie dust. Still working through that from Murph. I've got a can of the Mercenary Double IPA from Odell Brewing, which is a Colorado brewery. I'm about to Love crack Odell. that can open. Yeah, it's really good. I am actually drinking some water. What? I know. I am all out of beer. It's not the <laughs> Alki water, the old Kirkland vodka, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will. If you're coherent by the end of the episode, it wasn't. <laughs> so, uh, Harris, uh, who are you? Why are you here tonight? I'm here because I am a big fan of the pod, and we just connected, and I have a lot of experience. You know, I've worked for a couple different maker, uh, you know, companies, open source companies, from Life Objects, who makes the Lulzbot printers, to System76, and I was on the Open Source Hardware Association board uh, for a term and helped out there. So you know, nice. and I yeah, so so I've got a, I've had experience in the space and excited to just kind of connect and talk with you guys about about a lot of different things. We're excited to have you. <laughs> yeah, and you can really tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be here too. And you know, I I did uh, I did just uh, you know kind of just this month I kind of went uh, indie went solo and I'm doing uh, sales and marketing kind of freelance consulting too. And so, um, you know, I've been kind of reaching out. That's, that's kind of part of it too, is just kind of figuring out some exciting companies uh, to potentially work with too. So that is, that's part of myself, self-interest too. Oh, excellent. Yeah. That'll be a real nice segue into our main topic when we get there. Yep. Which is uh, ideas on going out and doing your own thing as far as a maker or freelancer, whatever. All three of us have, well, Harris just started, Joe's considering it, and I'm just in the very beginning phases of maybe doing my own software company, so th this will be an interesting topic to kind of go over. First, we have some uh, news. Um, first up is there's an announcement that there may not be a Maker Faire in uh, San Francisco next year. San Mateo. but San Mateo, my bad. I'm, I'm so sad because I, I haven't made a Bay Area Maker Faire yet, and... Last year, uh, somebody was like, you, you should go next year to at least the two main maker fairs because it might be the last year. And then seeing this article that was posted uh, where Dale Doherty almost confirms that this is the last year of Bay Area makes me super sad and also instigates me to make sure that I make New York. But that said, and something that uh, Ian Cole, who runs the Miami Maker Fair, pointed out today that just because the two flagship fairs that are put on by Make Magazine that's themselves that are you know 100,000 person events and cost thousands of dollars to put on, just because those might end doesn't mean that the community ran fairs and the off-branded Maker Fests like we run, like Aaron and I run, are ending and this is just even more reason why the community should support the non-branded fairs and the like kind of offshoot ones um so that the maker community can keep going with their events um they're really really critical to maker growth and maker networking and keeping that community alive so i think it's very important yeah, you know, I think making too, kind of as a subculture, you know, there's always those lighthouse organizations or events that people that are outside of kind of making broadly might associate. I think Maker Fair is definitely one of those. I think a lot of people, it was kind of their first experience um, finding these like minded people, you know, walking around and the paella cookout thing and, you know, sort of the goofy sort of steampunk robots. And sort of realizing, oh, there's other people like me that think this is cool. Um, but I don't think that, like I think to your, to your point, Joe, it's there's other events, there's other communities that kind of overlap with this. And this is a really visible part of it. And I think Make, Make has been a big part of the, I think, creating awareness 
Um, mm-hmm. But it is more than that, too. Yeah. So what's your take on the fairs? Because a lot of what you've done in the past has been like the marketing and the event organization stuff, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. So I've been participated. I've been a, you know, at, at companies who have been boot sponsors. Maker Fair is pretty expensive. Um, and it would get more expensive kind of, this is going back a few years. And I think you could tell they were trying to figure out how do they host a big event that's really expensive in these major metropolitan areas. Um, you know, I think early on it was a little more arts and crafty and you could see that they were, or my assumption, I don't know. I mean, I didn't, you know, I don't know a Dale Darty personally or anything like that, but it mm-hmm. seemed like they were trying to figure out how do we get more dollars in the door? to pay for this because this is a big space. There's a lot going on. I mean, you're doing events, you've got liability and there's all these things that can go wrong and that you have to pre- try to prepare for. And you got porta potties and just sort of all this weird you know, stuff that you don't think of when you're just walking around as an attendee. But yeah. when you go ahead, like a couple of days before during setup and during teardown, you realize that they're like building a city, you know, sort of in 12 hours. Um, so you know, I think, I think that was a challenge. And I think you saw some of the smaller, uh, you know, to mid-sized maker companies that are a couple million dollars in revenue and up um, have a hard time with covering the cost of attending um, yeah. because it wasn't like some industry shows that you go to where it's really clear that there's customers that are going to pay. You know, a lot of times families would go and schools would go and that's good for the exposure, but it's also hard to maybe translate, okay, what am I, as a as a small company, small business, as a maker business, what am I getting out of this? And so you started to see more of those major brands participate like Toyota and Disney who saw the maker demographic as the type of people who would maybe watch their movie or get their SUV. Um, and so I think there was this tension between those large dollar donors who saw the maker demographic versus the maker businesses. And then you've got the, you know, real makers, the single person, you know, who just has a cool thing they want to show off. Um, so I think there's a lot of tension between those different things. Yeah. Well, and, the community response that I've seen since this announcement uh, highlighted a lot of that, especially in the the lighthouse fairs, like you mentioned, um, you know, they became more and more about commercial booths and less and less about uh, little Joey wants to show off his robot machine that he built. I don't know. I, it seemed like a lot of people started to feel like the maker fairs started to lose their heart a little bit as you're growing into these hundred thousand Pearson events that you have to pay for them somehow. So, yeah, and you know, I know they had, you know, the obviously the magazine and then Maker Shed, you know, it seemed like from the outside that they were and have been and can continue to be kind of throwing a lot of different things at it, right? To figure out we know what, what this is, we know this is important, we know people care about it, but how do we build a business around it? And it seemed like from the outside that they were trying different things. Yeah. Um and and you know, maybe this is just the next step of that sort of reinvention process and Iterate, iterating process for the business itself yeah and you know, as we've kind of seen over the last couple of years it's hard to build a sustainable business around the maker community like tech shop failing was a, a big kind of awakening i think for the people running commercial maker spaces and like now seeing this it's it's making me wonder what's kind of next in that world yeah yeah i agree uh, the tech shop news, I remember when that happened a couple years ago, I was kind of surprised by that, actually. Yeah, so was I. We were getting ready to build a tech shop uh, RAN space in Peoria. And um, we had just gotten kind of like a sustainability report from tech shop that basically said that unless we manage it, we don't think it would be sustainable. And then the next day they announced bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> literally the next day so um wow. yeah we were shocked too <laughs> to say the least well but now you got river, river city well river city was always there it was at that point about four years old oh um, okay i didn't realize the history wow okay i didn't realize that yeah and then we as um uh, i was president at the time and then one of our other board members and I were sitting on the advisory board for building this space. It was always kind of the intent that like River City Labs was going to um, service the maker community. And then this space was going to service the entrepreneurial community that we mm. just didn't have this, the resources to deal with and, and like allow people to try to build businesses rather than 
us where people are just trying to build projects and maybe a business. That makes sense. It was it was a weird spot. And you know, with all the research we found that like the two types of spaces really service completely different types of individuals. So we weren't even going to be competitors. We were more going to be like siblings in the business world. It was a very odd situation. Well, I think that reflects what's going on with the uh, make thing too, right? It's like make magazines trying to figure it out. These different maker spaces are trying to figure it out. Um, there's this sort of overlapping passion of making things and sort of this creative expression through yeah. engineering and through software. But yeah, it's just a means, right? It's not an end. Yeah. And, you know, um, two years ago, Make was looking at doing a lighthouse event in Chicago and uh, they approached us to be maker curators. And um, you were asking about our experience with maker fairs and maker events. And I brought up our maker fest that we run here, uh, which is between a four and 5,000 person event. And, you know, Dale's question to me was like, well, why isn't it a, a mini maker fair or, you know, even a, a regional re regional maker fair? And the, the answer was the restrictions that make put on uh, those events would have made it so that we couldn't do our event the way we do it, which is what has made it so successful, mm. which is we pair our event with our art community. And it's like half of a maker fest and half of an art fair and half of a uh, concert. And like it has all of these dynamics that when you do a branded maker fair, they just don't let you do. Um, so it, it, that made it hard. Um, and it made it harder for us to be successful. So I don't know, maybe, maybe they needed to look into how they were managing that. I don't know. Yeah. Well, maybe with the change, this change on the, the big events, they'll oh, re this could their turn strategy. Into a whole episode. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Article yeah. one. You guys ready for the next topic? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, totally. All right, okay. So this week, uh, it's pretty heavy news, but uh, Kendrick Castillo's story. Um, he was a he was a senior at a STEM school in Colorado. He lunged at a, a gunman at their school and helped save students and teachers. I think they said there was yeah, eight were injured. Yes, um, and they believe it would have been much more if he hadn't been brave and stood up against them and lunged at him and. Help, help, uh, you know, stave, stave him off until uh, security or the police came. Yeah. But his dad wants to get a story out for his bravery, and so we kind of wanted to give a link to the article for it because he was he was actually really connected within the local maker community there in Colorado. Our hearts go out to that family. Yep. Yeah, that was uh, it's a it's a pretty rough story and sounded like a pretty incredible kid. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a really tough story, and I mean, it's definitely hit people here. Last news topic for tonight. Uh, there's a Hackaday article on a new 32-bit 3D printer control board. It, it was submitted for the, the latest Hackaday contest, and it is geared to be the new kind of ramps drop-in for your printer. So all the 32-bit control boards you see now are all high-end, so you got like you know, the Duets, what else, like the Aztegs. But, yeah, the smoothie boards, the... Uh uh replicates yeah so like 100 bucks plus this project is looking to create a drop-in 32-bit ramps replacement um, but uses a 32-bit or microcontroller it's using a 72 megahertz um, stm32 chip and they're including trinamic drivers so you can get the near silent operation um, it has a built-in cooling fan and the neatest thing i think is that it has a xt60 connector so if you wanted to you could power your printer with a giant battery. Yes. They're aiming for a low cost replacement. So that'll be, that'll be really interesting to see that flesh out because it'll, I mean, the only reason that ramps and everything has been so prolific is for how cheap and open source it is. Yeah. I'm shocked. We haven't seen more boards come out with the XT60. It's such a, a nice form factor for a power connector. And it's so robust uh, compared to like screw terminals. Like it's so easy to just pop your connection off and then, and like pick it up and go if you needed to. Like, I'm re I'm really shocked we haven't seen that more. So I'm excited for this board. I really am. Yeah, I always like connectors that are uh, polarized, where they yes. only fit in one way. 
or I guess you can call it polka yoked is the uh, engineering term or idiot proofed <laughs> <laughs> uh, at my at my old company that I worked with. Um, they made uh, tankless water heaters and every connector on the control board had a different connector such that no uh, no connector could be misplugged in. They had a small assembly line, but now all their sensors and all their control board connectors, there's only one place it could fit. And I always kind of liked that. It really, you know, you kind of eliminate any sort of uh, misassembly. Uh, yeah, you up up your part count, which ups, ups your bomb cost, but definitely makes it harder to screw up. It's like, like a PC. You know, on the back, you, you can't put the wrong connector in the wrong place. It's impossible now. It's awful nice. <laughs> and All right. Well, hey, that was it for news. Can you guys oh, hear yeah. me, by the way? We've got plenty of time left can you guys hear me, by for the our way? main topic. No. So... Who wants to kick it off? So we had a couple things to talk about. And the first one I really wanted to talk about with you, Harris, is open source and business. You've been part of so many open source businesses now. Can you give us like a, a quick overview on how that works? Because so often we hear that you know, if we if we go open source, we can't make money and we can't build a business around that. So it's interesting. I think on the hardware side, there's maker companies that listeners of the podcast, I'm sure, are familiar with, like Adafruit, uh, SparkFun, Lulzbot, Prusa. You know, it's interesting because I spent some time, I worked System76, and there's this whole other commercial side on open source software as well. Uh, you know, there's a company, Elastic, who had a very successful uh, IPO, you know, and they're built and they use free software in a lot of their products. And, you know, of course, the Red Hat. Um, acquisition by IBM, which was like one of the biggest acquisitions ever. Um, so I think there's lots and lots and lots of ways to build business models around open source and around sort of sharing how your pro products work within technology specifically. So what kind of models have you seen that have been uh, successful? Well, the most, it seems like the, on the hardware side, you know, Nate, Nate Seidel has a really kind of classic talk that a TED talk that he gave about how they do it at SparkFun, but I mean, you know, they basically design a product and then charge more for it than it costs them to make it, right? <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old school business model. And, I, you know, Adafruit, in fact, has the same business model, you know. Um, but really what they're doing, I think what SparkFun and Adafruit and companies like them do well um, is I think they just really listen to the customers. Uh, you know, Osh Park is another one um, that I think of where you know, they just really, really listen to their customers and they focus on what the engineers want and they try to build product around that. And so I think on the hardware side, charging enough is actually, it can be hard because sometimes, you know, the end users want, want to pay less or maybe you forget to accommodate for costs for things like packaging or distribution channels and things like that. Um, so, you know, charging for sure. And then I think you see also, you know, System76 kind of similar thing, but I think you see other strategies around, you know, a freemium model and then you charge more later or maybe you've got materials, you know, you're charging for materials and you can make more recurring revenue over time. Um, you know, like Prusa, especially with, you know, having the Prusa and making their own materials in house. Um, mm -hmm. I can only assume they're getting better margins on that versus what they were buying from the open market. Um, how, do, how do you think licensing plays into that? That's a great question. I uh, mean... And that's a big one. <laughs> that's a big question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, go ahead. So specifically, like one thing that's always boggled my mind is, you know, we, we see open source products cloned in China constantly, but what I've never seen cloned in China is a, a Lulzbot product. And at, at Lulzbot, we always clung to the most open license possible. Um, so I, I've never understood why somebody didn't clone anything, um, and then, you know, make it available for super cheap on like AliExpress or something like that. But, sure. um, yeah, like when you're, when you're making the argument for like an open source license, I, I, it's hard for me to be able to make a recommendation for what license specifically somebody should go for. Yeah, or if they should go for like a dual license. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's 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 a lot to this one. So first on the like clone thing, you know, I mean, 
cl cloning definitely, you know, you do see open source companies whose products are cloned, but you also see closed source companies whose products are cloned. You know, you can yeah. get a you can get an iPhone <laughs> for a yeah. lot less than an iPhone <laughs> normally costs. Um, you know, I think the typical protections actually lie more on the trademark side. Uh, and, you know, the ability to use a, a registered trademark associated with a company. Um, I think sometimes it's a function of whether a design is something that another company wants to clone or not. You know, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of really smart engineers at hardware companies in China, too. And they have some designs that they think are better, you know, and I sure are selling better. Um, so maybe yeah. that's a function of it. You know, maybe, you know, sometimes being copied is a, is a good compliment because it means you're putting something out there that people want to copy. Right. Um, so I think that's part of it. Trademarks are part of it. I think it's also the other value around customer support or reliability or, um, you know, maybe you're doing some custom consulting or some custom software that you layer on top of the product. So I think there's things like that that can um, maybe that are like other variables um, versus like, you know, not as simple as just like having a bomb necessarily. Mm -hmm you know, and other people being able to, cause I mean, they can reverse engineer and take something apart. You know, there's, like I said, I mean, there's really, really capable, smart engineers yes. out there. I mean, they can take things apart faster, you know, and, and reverse it pretty quickly. So that's part of it. I think going with a free software license um, is important. I think it matters a lot to developers, you know, I think, but you also have a lot of successful projects that have more of like the MIT style license, like SparkFun does the MIT style licenses, whereas the left, you know, does the GPL. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it it depends. I think it depends on who you're who you're going for and, and what what kind of the core values you know that are built into the company. I think this company's doing it different different ways. I don't think there's any one way it has to be done. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think it's part of it. You know, I mean, I think the licenses you choose are part of it, and how and how you go to market it matters. I mean, it matters to developers and it matters to people who are going to partner with you. Um, it's a Definitely. really big, it's a big, big decision and it can make it a lot easier for people to copy your stuff, <laughs> you know, um, and maybe you don't want that. <laughs> As you've worked with companies with open source, you know what? Scratch that. Aaron, take that out. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Uh, Harris, you recently went out and started your own, you know, freelance company. What, uh, tell us a bit about your process and like your transition to that. What made you think about starting that and what kind of steps did you take to actually realize your dream of starting a consultant, whatever? Yeah, so it's kind of doing, having my own business has been an aspiration for a long time. I uh, actually, you guys will appreciate this, especially in high school, I uh, took a tech class. It was just called tech class, um, but uh, <laughs> but we were working with like lathes and, you know, we did some CNC stuff and. I got really into it. And so I ended up buying a jet lathe uh, back, I don't know, I think I was a sophomore in high school and ended up buying a bunch of materials. And I ended up making these pens out of like wood and uh, like uh, acrylic and selling them on consignment. <laughs> and nice. uh, yeah, nice. I did, I did pretty decently, marked them up, um, you know, and they had little different uh, types of, you know, they were these kind of these like kits that you could buy. And then there was like these blocks of wood and then you'd sort of, you know, work, work down with the lathe and then polish it up and sell them. And so that was, so I think it was kind of an entrepreneurial instinct. Um, working for, you know, it's interesting. I was with System76 and I really, really loved it there. I mean, the CEO, Carl, is a really good guy. The products are great. The culture is good. You know, I mean, on paper, it was like there wasn't a lot I could really complain about. But I still, it, it was, I think what really drove it home for me is I still had that itch even when there wasn't really anything I could complain about with my job, <laughs> I still kind of wanted to do it. And so that was sort of the signal to me of, I think I should try, I think I should try it out. Um, and so I just had some conversations with uh, friends and kind of my people that I had worked with over the years to see if there's any projects I could potentially help them with. And when I got a soft commitment for a couple of projects, I decided to go for it. And so I talked to an attorney, set up an LLC and, um, you know, just kind of set up a business bank account and set up a business address and kind of went through the, the, that, and it all just happened really quickly. And, and then I really, I woke up one day and realized, oh, I don't have a job anymore. 
and, <laughs> and uh, like in a good way right? yeah in a good way but i had a lot of nervous <laughs> energy you know so i actually went to the gym that that first day that wednesday when i woke up because it was kind of like oh my gosh i didn't want to get on the computer i was like too nervous energy wise so i just went to the gym and worked out and then kind of took a shower and was like okay now i'm ready to now i'm ready to go and uh so yeah i i knew exactly what you mean when you say that you've had like even though you had a really good job and you were happy there that you still had that itch but was your itch to actually start a business and work for yourself or was that itch to work on things that weren't necessarily your job that's where i have always been was like you know i've i've got my job and i'm really happy and i have a lot of fun doing that but at the same time i in the back of my head i always have this other thing that i would rather be working on that may or may not be making me money yeah that's a good question. I'll give you a cop out answer. I mean, it's kind of both. Like, I definitely <laughs> like the idea of um, working for myself. You know, uh, the idea of it. You know, sort of that I had in my mind that was appealing. But I, the other thing is, you know, I get a chance to like connect with these really cool companies over the years who are doing really cool things, and this feeling of like, well, it'd be nice if I could work with them too. Like, I like what I'm doing all day, every day, but what they're doing is pretty awesome. And it'd be cool to work with them on a project, you know, or to help them get something out to market or to help them think about how they want to start signing channel partners because I like what they're doing as, as well. So I think it, it was it's both. Uh, it, I don't think it's the way that, like, uh, I guess my interest was, wasn't necessarily in, like, a specific activity, although I definitely have seen that. Like in working mm -hmm. with clients that I'm working with, I'm learning new CRM tools and I'm learning how they think about it. And I'm like, I'm learning more than I've ever learned in a very short amount of time. But I think it was just also this idea of like these other businesses that are also doing cool stuff. And I, I'd like to work with more than one place at a time, I guess. Boy, I really, really, really know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> as I go through out, talking to different companies just like going and networking and, and meeting new people i'm always like boy i really want to work on that project with you i really want to work on on this with this person and um as an engineer that works on more physical things it's it's hard to, to divide your time like that so I, i'm very happy for you that you can do that that's awesome yeah i'm, I'm excited you know i mean and then you start to realize that I mean, for me, and I think it's, I would assume it's probably true for you too. Like, you know, a lot of these problems that companies are trying to tackle, you're like, oh, this isn't, this is actually more common than you think, you know, and, and there's some things that we can do to kind of like solve this puzzle. Um, you know, and I feel like from an engineering perspective, I mean, you, there's definitely principles, you know, in physics and mechanical engineering and how things work, you know, and like, I feel like, you know, if you, if you, you get to be in a couple different contexts, designing in a couple different product categories, all of a sudden you're able to like pull from these totally different areas uh, yes. to, to solve problems. And I, I would imagine that that would be pretty exciting for you, you know, cause it's yeah. like, Oh, I, this reminds me of this totally random other thing I was designing and it's actually not similar to what you're doing at all, but it actually is. And here's why. Yeah. Well, that was how my last job was. It was so, you know, I was working on textile equipment, which or designing textile equipment, which is completely different than anything I've ever done. And it, it had so many parallels to all of the things that I've always done. So, um, yeah, totally. Uh, one of the things you said that you did when you started your business was that you started an LLC. What made you decide to do an LLC over like a sole proprietorship or an incorporation or something like that? Sure. So my main goal in this is like, I don't want to, at this point in time, I don't want to like hire a bunch of people. <laughs> Like, I just want to keep it really simple. I just want to take on the projects that I'm interested in and work with the companies that I'm interested in working with. And so I want to have a really simple, um, like legal structure and simple tax, um, structure too, like in terms of how I need to think about my taxes and how those are going to get filed and paid and how I think about the business and how it's registered and set up. So that was, I want to kind of, I wanted to op optimize for just simplicity because I'm not trying to build a billion dollar business here. Like I really want to just be able to work with cool companies. And if I want to take on extra project, do that. Or if I want to take, take on not a lot of projects and have like a 
more relaxed season of life. Um, you know, as my wife and I are, you know, thinking about kind of what's what's next for our family. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted, wanted to be able to just kind of like dial things up, dial things down, and so I felt like that was the right that was the right decision for me to keep it simple. Okay. Um. I, I guess as somebody who's looking into this right now, um, so I'm looking into doing something where I might be manufacturing furniture or I might be doing contract engineering on the side. Is that something, um, is an LLC something that you would recommend for somebody like me or is sticking with something like a sole proprietorship? Yeah. I easier. I mean, so a, a really important thing is, with the LLC is that there's like some formality in place in order for it to, to really follow the letter and the spirit of kind of the protections that come with being an LLC. And I'll just say right here, right now, I am not an attorney. (laughs) No. (laughs) So, so, you know, keep, keep that in mind. Neither are we. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I am not a lawyer as, you know, as the acronym of those. Um, but, um, so, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the benefit there, there are some kind of some constraints around, around doing an LLC, you know, you really, you really needs to be separate, you know, like you, you know, the, the more separate the business is and you set up rules for the business and then the, the business sort of hires you sort of to work for it, um, you know, in kind of separation of, uh, you know, bookkeeping and sort of as many things as possible. Um, I think anything where you're taking on projects and there could be a, disagreement with a client and you know in case things could get litigious you know i think some of the um the separation that comes with operating as an llc can provide peace of mind um okay you know and, and obviously you never want that to happen i mean but it, it, it yeah. just it just could and that's one of the benefits of, of having that liability you know because it stands for limited liability corporation right and that's kind of like one right. of the main one of the main aspects of it um at, you know s corp if you're doing an S corp or a C corp or something like that, there's just more, there's more like governance um, overhead associated with that um, from, from like the legal perspective for the, for the corporate entity, um, you know, around, uh, it depends on what state you're in, but it, there's going to be more um, c- commitments that you have to kind of make sure that you're keeping current with. And, you know, you, you it just operates, the businesses will operate a little bit differently. Um, okay. And then there's different tax implications too. Okay. But you could have multiple, right? I mean, you can have an LLC for your freelance engineering work, and then you can set up another company, you know, um, for potentially the furniture business. In fact, I would recommend that uh, personally. Um, okay. To to keep it separate, you know, and in case one takes off, great. <laughs> um, and then that yeah. other business can hire people, you know, and if as long, you know, and it doesn't cost a ton of money. I mean, obviously, it does cost money, and so, you know, it there's that's a function of privilege there in terms of having the cash flow to get things in place but in general what you know i think having separate entities probably for each of those businesses would probably make a lot of sense this is this is good information <laughs> hopefully this is helping people other than me uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about aaron you said you were kind of curious on the software side i was curious you know what are you yeah. thinking about if you don't mind sharing yeah so i was waiting for a good opening with the previous discussion on on the why you were doing it because I also have the exact same feeling with this job and my last job, which were both very fulfilling jobs in tech. But even though I enjoy both my job, like my previous job and I enjoyed this job, I've come to the conclusion that I'm just never going to be happy working for somebody else. I think I'm kind of smart. <laughs> and, you know, that can be up for discussion. But why should I be giving away my expertise and my creativity and my intelligence to somebody else for, to solve their problems, which I don't necessarily care about that much, when I could be doing that solving problems that I actually care about? Also, I've seen like the hourly rate that I get charged to other groups, and I'm like, why don't I get paid that rate? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as far as my, my current idea is uh, working towards a portfolio of web apps and kind of maintaining those. And the idea being that they'd be, you know, um, software as a service type web apps. Because that's essentially what I do right now is uh, on my team, we, we maintain a bunch of internal web apps to Caterpillar. But, uh, so my, my first stab at this is probably going to be the Makerspace Access Control System. Which, if you know, if you, if you listen to the, the show at all, 
it's been kind of an ongoing topic that we talk about. Um, but it's a it's a way for makerspaces to control access to machines based on if that user is trained or not. And it's a RFID badge in and badge out system. Originally, it was going to be a fully local to the to, to the makerspace, like within the LAN. Um, since I started thinking about doing my own my own business and doing this my own software thing, I'm kind of repositioning the entire system to be cloud based. I'm still working on a tech stack for it, but it's going to be primarily cloud based. But there will be an option to self host if you want, and that comes down to the whole uh, you know making money with open source software because. Yep. If it's in a Git repo, you can just clone it and you know build it yourself. Um, my current plan is to sell kits for the hardware for the machines, which will be like a, a circuit board with an ESP32 on it and like an RFID scanner. Mm-hmm. And all they'll ha- and there'll be instructions, and all they'll have to do is load up an Arduino sketch and plug in their Wi-Fi password and stuff, and then it'll just start posting to the to the cloud. And my idea was that there'll be a web app that, you know, they would, you know, make an account, get like a secret key or whatever, and that key would go into each machine, and that would essentially identify that machine with this customer. But then I was thinking about charging, you know, a monthly fee per machine, so maybe like $2, $3 a month per machine to, you know, have it all maintained in the cloud for you, because I know a lot of spaces don't have the technical expertise to self-host their own stuff, but they want to support open source and they like open hardware solutions so i mean this would solve all of that and then give them the option to not have to host it themselves if they don't want to that makes, i was also thinking about it makes a ton of sense sorry i mean interrupt you go ahead oh yeah and and currently i've been thinking about maybe you know having an open source but then maybe like charging for a, a an image for a raspberry pi so like if you wanted to go through all the legwork to build the image yourself you can do that for free and that's completely on you but if you want he'll self-host it yourself um, I'm thinking about creating like a Raspberry Pi image and then you'd be like, you know, 20 bucks and you can just flash it to an SD card and throw it in a pie and you're good to go. Now, if you did that model, would you clearly lay out the steps to build that image yourself or oh, would no. you, would you do it? That'd be up to the community. The everyone, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the way everyone else does it where it's a journey and you got to find the steps to that journey. <laughs> yeah. Open desk CC. I mean, it, it comes back to our discussion on being paid for your skills, right? Yes. I mean, totally. I, I, I've developed all these skills in, in technology and development. And if I just, you know, completely lay everything 100% out there that you could just do all of it, then I'm, I'm essentially lit, I'm belittling my own skill set when I'm trying to make money off of it. So, But at the same time, it's, it's sharing, right? It's, it's uh, you know, building the community by openly sharing the, your skills and knowledge they there's arguments to be made for both oh i know and i agree with both of them depending on my state of mind that day <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i yeah I, I think you can definitely i can see the arguments both ways for sure i mean i think you know it's also a known problem that open source maintainers um are sort of chronically underpaid underappreciated you know yep and so i uh i generally i think it's important that those folks get paid for their work and they they get to capture some of the value they're some of the value they're creating um i mean and the idea of equipment access control and things like that i mean that's incredibly valuable um you know i mean that's that's really important people could get hurt (laughs) you know i mean it's the kind of thing that could save someone's hand, you know, if they if they don't know mm-hmm. if they don't know how to use a bandsaw, then maybe they shouldn't be able to use a bandsaw. Yes, right. Also, this platform would allow you to also uh, gather metrics on machine usage and uh, usage by person. So my the secondary goal for this system was to be able to to monitor how often a user uses a machine, and then be able to set up. Maybe not with this system, but at least have like an API or, or some sort of report that they can export. And then you can then turn around and invoice users, you know, for, you know, 50 minutes of the laser for this month. Or you use the 3D printers for, you know, 72 hours this month, you know, and then and then be able to check. Because like our space, we, we have, it's only like 45 a month for the basic membership. That barely covers rent. It doesn't. It doesn't leave us much for budgeting for machine uh, upkeep and or getting new machines. So this would allow us to keep a low introductory rate to get into the space, and then it can get as expensive as you want depending on the tools and how often you use those tools. Have you considered yeah. the corporate makerspaces as a like 
potential application as well, or are you thinking more of these uh, community-run type spaces? Because I know a lot of I mean, businesses have, you know, these internal innovation centers and things like that. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, it would work. Uh, I, I've just been, I just have experience with uh, local community organ uh, maker spaces. Yeah. So that's kind of been my, my, uh, my, ta my target demographic. But I mean, so we we actually had a member talk with our local carpenters guild, and they were interested in it as well. Oh, cool. So I mean, it's not not even just maker spaces, just any community ran tool shop, or any any plug in thing that they would like badge access on, because really there's no cheap uh, badge access systems for non companies, because those 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 security systems are like you know four or five grand, at least. Mm. This would be like thirty bucks a sensor. Yeah, but like he brings up a really good point because you know I know Lowe's has a corporate innovation space, Google has a corporate, inter they have maker spaces at every location, uh, and we actually know the people that run them. Hi Tim, you gave me crimpers, and I love them. <laughs> um, and it, multiple corporations totally have spaces like this, so like. Yeah, you and might be getting into something. You know, instead of having the um, charge, you know, charge at the individual member level, you know, what they would be presumably looking for would be some sort of just budget allocation, right? So it's right. like, okay, we've got three different departments that gener you know, that have access to the space, and each of them have a budget, and so you know, we can automate, you know, integrate with whatever bookkeeping. You know, this is just sort of brainstorming, right? But integrate with whatever bookkeeping system so that they're getting docked. Uh, you know, the, the right budget is getting hit every time, whatever the system is being used. And maybe it doesn't matter for like a desktop 3D printer if you're talking about, you know, PLA or something. But if you've got a $25,000, $100,000 3D printer or something, you know, yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're printing in Ultem or whatever, then it's like, yeah, it'd be good to keep track of that <laughs> or yeah, titanium you know. or something. <laughs> When your rolls of filament cost a thousand dollars, people care about where that filament went. <laughs> you can't make yeah. three hundred dollar benches here, guys. You just can't. Um, <laughs> yeah. But they, they, one of the hardest things that I had when um, I was running the the cat corporate maker space was just tracking material usage and setting up ordering dates and things like that. And that could totally be ran through something like this. So, you know. Keep this podcast in the in your back pocket, Aaron. When you when you start launching this product for new feature releases and, <laughs> and plugins, yeah, so many ideas. Yeah, I definitely been approaching this with kind of the the Linux mindset, which is a uh, focus on one thing and do it really well, and then be able to integrate with everything else. Right. It's like I don't want it to be a payment system or a a monthly report thing or whatever, but you know, be able to generate a report and be like use whatever payment system you want and they'll integrate and you, you know, maybe you either have an API or just a, a, a report that you can consume and then throw it through something else. I, I like to keep my things simple. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the only, the only other thought I have just kind of on this idea in general is, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people who have been out doing, doing their own thing, just kind of in anticipation of me deciding to go out on my own. And, you know, there's never a, perfect time to do it and you can time it and plan it and there's obviously some ways to to go out and start something new that are better than others you know um but you know shout out a, a, a mutual friend and former colleague of both of us joe uh brent over at the colorado printing project you know yeah. he's he's doing his own thing he's doing this design engineering consulting and he's been experimenting with introducing and bringing his own products to market and um, it's been really cool seeing him build his business and work with some pretty cool customers. And uh, it's kind of like it's never going to be, it's never going to be easy. The timing's never going to be perfect. And so, you know, it, whenever you know, maybe and maybe maybe people never get there. But if if you're thinking about it, at some point you just got to be like, all right, I'm going to just go for this. And worst case scenario, I like will put up put up rack up a little bit of debt or ask pull in call for some favors or figure it out. But you know, sometimes you just yeah. got to just roll the dice, right? Well, it's it's like having kids. Like, there's there's never a good time, so you may as well just do it like, <laughs> kind of thing. I, I was going to make the same joke. Um, <laughs> but, you know, with, with me, uh, when I left Caterpillar to go work for Lulz, it, it was kind of the same, almost the same kind of dice rolling where um, I, I just hit a point where I was like, well, 
if I'm going to take a risk, I should do it now while I'm young enough to still recover from it. If it, if it is a risk even, and I should just go work on something I'm passionate about rather than just working a job that pays the bills. And now I did it. And it, I, I haven't looked back. I, I have been enjoying my work life since I left. And now I might enjoy my work life more if I do this thing that I'm thinking about. So I, I don't know. I'm excited for the possibilities. I'm, I'm glad that you're excited so far, Harris. So, uh, Aaron, you should quit your job too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do this thing. <laughs> End up in some maker hippie commune because none of us can pay our bills. I don't. Know. Yeah, exactly. Sleep, <laughs> sleeping underneath a CNC machine at the makerspace. We can make Kyori's version of the was at the ghost ship. Yes. Or whatever that that maker colony was. <laughs> yeah, but let's not burn it down. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, like if I didn't have a wife and kids, I would totally have already done this and be sleeping underneath the CNC machine. I would totally be fine with that. But like other people depend on me and somebody would be giving me the stink eye right now. Should we be sleeping underneath the CNC machine? So, <laughs> which is a reasonable concern. <laughs> it is. It totally is. If you use a Maslow, Joe, it, it's a, it's a, it can be a lean to. Yeah. Because it's at an angle. But, like, it also wouldn't make things very well, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, life's about trade-offs, you know? Yes, it really, really is. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, Aaron, did you have more questions? I mean, I have a lot, so we can probably break this into two episodes. Because <laughs> we're already at the hour mark. Okay. It was really, really fun to have you on tonight, Harris. I, I look forward to having you on in the future. Thanks for having yeah. me on, yeah. guys. Like I said, I, I really I really do enjoy the pod. I think it's it's cool and I think these are you know <laughs> present present episode excluded. I think really interesting conversations uh that people should be listening to. I don't know if people should be listening to me, but <laughs> otherwise I'm a fan for sure. No, this was a great episode. It, it gave me some clarity on uh some things that I need to be looking into in the very near future. So at the very least, thank you. <laughs> we we mentioned it before we started recording, but you know we kind of made a point with the show as a whole to not, we don't want to focus at all on like making money being a maker. Right. You know, we figured an episode or two wouldn't hurt anything. And it is a bit, it is pretty tangent to what a lot of people, you know, are interested in. So we figured it'd be an, an interesting episode to do one or two of. Totally. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add for, uh, where can people find you if they, uh, if they've listened to the episode and they're like, I really want Harris's advice. Where can they find you? Sure. So I'm on Twitter, just at Harris Kenny, um, H A R R I S K E N N Y, and uh, my my business that I'm working with clients on is called Kenny Consulting Group, and the website's just KennyConsultingGroup.com. Um, I, I'm really fortunate. I've got some pretty amazing clients that I'm working with that are doing some pretty cool things um, in tech and some really neat open source projects as well. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm working on some pretty cool stuff and I've got a lot of sort of random experiences. So I'm always up for a phone call. Um, you know, if folks want to talk about what they're trying to do, bring to market, or even just, you know, conversation we had today about, should I go do my own thing or not? <laughs> um, I think that's a, it's a fun conversation to have. And, you know, I support people and thinking about going for it because I don't know, why not? You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's been a pretty fun experience so far. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on, man. I I really appreciate it. So sure thing. Yeah, this is the end of the podcast. <laughs> I was waiting for you to do that so many times, Aaron. 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 Aaron.